All right, fellow intelligent investors, fasten your seatbelts because the content of this video is actually quite dense and there's a lot to learn about profitability, metrics, valuation, screening methods and much more. My name is René Zellman and on this channel we provide tips and tricks that should help investors to find great companies to invest in, avoid expensive investing mistakes and earn above average returns. More specifically, in this video you will learn what the magic formula is, how the magic formula has performed in the past and what returns investors can expect in the future. We will also address why the magic formula screen has recently delivered somewhat disappointing results. And finally, uh, I will outline what you as an investor need to do and how you can couple the formula with other variables to boost your returns. So without further ado, let's get started. Have you ever wondered how you can make your hard-earned money work for you? Have you ever dreamed of building generational wealth and leaving a legacy? My name is René Zellman and I'll teach you how you can manage and invest your money with confidence, a long-term vision and without losing your mind. Join me on my journey of intelligent investing and learn how smart people can compound their money effectively and accumulate wealth. Now, before I get started, I wanted to ask you whether you have used the magic formula screen in the past and what has your experience been like? Would you recommend it to other investors as a screening tool? Comment down below and maybe we can get an interesting discussion going. So let me first give you some context. Why did I decide to plan and shoot this video? Well, as an investor, one is constantly looking for ways to generate new investment ideas and you have plenty of options. For instance, you can use regular stock screeners like Finvis. You can observe what superstar investors like Warren Buffett do and look at their 13F filings. You can read blogs such as Focus Compounding or Clark Street Value. Or you can follow like-minded investors on Twitter and get inspired by their ideas. But yet another way to come across wonderful business ideas or investment ideas is the so-called magic formula. I will explain what the magic formula is and what it does in, a, in more detail in a bit. But briefly speaking, it is a free and simple stock screening tool that looks for high quality businesses that are available at a cheap price. And that's exactly the kind of investment style that I refer to as intelligent investing. It's the style I practice. In the book, the little book that beats the market, we can find the following table which illustrates that an investor that stuck to the magic formula investing approach for a period of 17 years would have achieved an annual rate of return of 22.9%. That's insanely good. If you had started to invest $12,000 in 1988 and continued to contribute $1,000 each month, you would have ended with $3 million in 2005. If you can achieve a rate of return of almost 23%, your money will almost double every three years. However, there is one major problem. The Magic Formula screen has recently underperformed, or actually it has underperformed most benchmark indices for a relatively long period of time now, and also by, by quite a margin. I recently came across a Twitter post by the user ValueStockGeek. In October, he posted the following table taken from the American Association of Individual Investors. The association has been tracking the magic formula screen ever since the book was published in 2004 and recorded the screen's performance. It shows that the magic formula approach only delivered an annualized, annualized rate of return of around 6% ever since Greenplot's book was published. And thus the magic formula screen has underperformed the S&P 500 by quite a bit and certainly delivered much worse returns than the magic formula screen promised based on the period between 1988 and 2004. Investing $12,000 every year for 17 years, and again you contribute $1,000 each month, uh, would lead to a final net worth of roughly $400,000 instead of $3 million. Don't get me wrong here, that's an impressive result, but it's certainly not what you would expect if you would have read Greenblatt's book. Now, why do you think that's the case? What's the reason for this bad performance? 
I mean, the screener has performed exceptionally well for 17 years, and that's quite a long period. A drop from 23% annually to 6% annually is quite shocking in my opinion. Is everyone using the magic formula and thus driving down returns? I suggest you maybe stop the video here and try to think about possible explanations before you move on. I think it's quite a nice mental exercise, especially if you consider yourself a somewhat experienced investor. Before I move on, I just wanted to let you know that if you like the content so far, it would help me out a great deal if you hit the subscribe button or just like the video or share it with friends and family or on platforms such as Twitter, Reddit or Facebook. This helps to crack, crack the uh, YouTube algorithm and grow the channel faster. Thank you. Okay, before we actually discuss some of the possible reasons for this weaker performance, we first need to briefly take a closer look at the magic formula, what it does and the ingredients of the formula. For starters, the magic formula is a screening method, an investment strategy that was developed by Joel Greenblatt. And Joel Greenblatt can certainly be considered a superstar investor. And he's also a professor at Columbia University, if I remember correctly. His investment results have been quite remarkable as he achieved an annualized rate of return of 40% over a 20 year period, I think from 1985 to 2005. In essence, the magic formula is a relatively simple and easy to understand method for value investing. It helps you find high quality companies that are trading at an attractive price. And Greenblatt broke this philosophy down to two formulas and built a website that allows, that allows investors to filter out companies based on his approach. Basically, the formula scans the universe of stocks and then boils it down to around 50 companies, ranking the stocks based on their price and returns on capital. I put a link to the website in the descriptions down below. And more specifically, Greenblatt argues that investors should focus on two criteria when looking at investment opportunities. Firstly, investors should pay attention to the price. If you pay a bargain price, you are more likely to achieve above average returns. This can be considered the value component of the magic formula. One way to ensure that one pays a bargain price when you're purchasing a stock is to buy businesses that earn more relative to the price you are paying. And hence the first formula is basically what is commonly referred to as earnings yield. And Greenblood uses operating income and a firm's enterprise value. It's important to stress here that Greenblatt uses enterprise value, as enterprise value, unlike a company's market capitalization, also reflects a firm's cash position or a firm's liabilities. And he also prefers operating income over net income. Secondly, investors should buy good businesses rather than bad ones. And one way to ensure that one is looking at a high quality business is to purchase firms that can reinvest profits at high rates of return. The magic formula measures how efficiently a firm generates earnings from its assets. And this can be considered the quality component of the formula. And I guess I'll show you how Greenblatt calculates it on the screen right now. Here's how Greenblatt himself explains his approach. By eliminating companies that earn ordinary or poor returns on capital, the magic formula starts with a group of companies that have a high return on capital and then tries to buy these above average companies at below average prices. To put it in a nutshell, the magic formula system then ranks businesses in descending order based on each of these two metrics. The finalists should then present companies with the best combination of both return on capital and earnings yield. According to Greenblatt, combining these two points, so again, businesses with high returns on capital, but that are trading at a cheap price, is the secret to be a successful investor. So let's now focus on possible reasons for the disappointing performance ever since 2005. Well, first of all, a fundamental problem of backtesting for the purpose of finding an edge in the markets is that backtesting introduces a dangerous form of data mining bias. Of course, you could also refer to it as backtesting bias. 
Essentially, backtesting is the process of calculating how an investment or trading strategy would have fared historically. And this is what Greenblatt did when he wrote the book. Actually, it is fairly common that backtested strategies fail in real-time use. And this can be caused by various reasons. For instance, the strategy itself may be flawed. But also the tested strategy may depend on correlations which don't really exist. As I've outlined in my recent video on the impact of elections on the stock market, investors need to focus on causal relationships instead of correlations. I'll put a link to that video in the description down below. In addition, new conditions such as volume, interest rates or volatility may create new inputs for a market's behavior. Or maybe the person running the best tech backtest basically just used low quality data. So whenever someone comes up with a backtested strategy that promises exceptional results, you should get suspicious, be skeptical. However, I don't think that's the main reason why the magic formula in particular did not work in the recent past. Greenblatt incorporated fundamental investing principles in his formula. Buying above average companies at below average prices is destined to succeed in the long run. It's a timeless principle. Something else must be going on here. So here's another and second hypothesis. Well, if we take a closer look at Greenblatt's magic formula system, you realize that once you have the final ranking, Greenblatt suggests that you buy at least 20 and up to 30 stocks from that top 20 or 30 company list. Each stock should then be sold exactly after one year. And in taxable accounts, Greenblatt suggests paying attention to after-tax returns and timing the sales accordingly. And then you repeat the same process each year. Now, I would argue that intelligent investors might want to adjust the holding period. Sometimes it takes longer than a year for the gap between price and value to close. And obviously it would harm your returns if you would sell your stocks regardless of whether that gap has been closed yet or not. In fact, you might sell a stock after the 12 month period and then it would show up again in the magic formula list. Do you buy it again then? Also, I believe that one critical skill every long-term investor needs to possess is the ability to hold onto winners for a long period of time. Especially if a company can generate high returns on capital for a long period of time, I think it is crucial to let your winners run. So I think indiscriminately selling after one year is one of the weaknesses of the magic formula approach. And I think there's a third explanation even. And I, in my view, it's the major reason why the magic formula approach didn't work in the recent past, so in the period between 2005 and 2019-20. I think the uh, magic formula screen didn't deliver disappointing results because of the co value component of the formula, so the uh, low multiple, but rather the quality component, so the return on invested capital. What intelligent investors need to realize is that capitalism works. And there's no doubt that capitalism can be very brutal. And due to this nature of capitalism, a business's profitability should decrease over the long term. Because being very profitable and earning high ROIC will naturally attract competition until all your excess returns are eroded away. Joseph Schumpeter referred to this inherent characteristic of capitalism as the process of creative destruction. destruction. Do you remember the three most successful phone makers of the 90s? Nokia, Ericsson and Motorola. They simply can no longer compete with the iPhone. Or look at where the US car industry is today and where it was in the 50s. In fact, about 3000 automobile companies have existed in the US. And today we can count the number of American car makers basically on one hand. Only very few companies possess some inherent qualities that protect them against attacks from competition. This is what Buffett refers to as economic modes. And as I said, it's an inherent quality and common examples would be a brand modes or switching costs, low cost advantages or intangible assets, assets such as patents. And a mode protects the market share and profitability of the business, 
helping the business to sustain its dominance. And these companies can resist the pull of economic gravity. And this is nicely illustrated by the following graph that I created the other day. So in the context of this video, it's important to stress that many companies achieve high returns on capital for a brief period of time without actually having a durable mode. If you simply buy businesses without qualitatively assessing whether the company can sustain its, its profit, profitability over a long period of time, this will harm you, your long-term returns as an investor. So the key question to ask is, how sustainable is return on invested capital? And if I had to put it in a nutshell, I'd say that companies with modes almost always have high ROIC, but companies with high ROIC may not have any mode at all. For instance, any company operating in an industry with a temporary supply shortage will briefly have high returns on capital. For example, you can look at the semiconductor industry, which by the way is a terrible industry as it's extremely capital intensive. And if you look at that industry, you will notice that most semiconductors will have had some years, uh, if you take a look at the past 10 years, during which they earned high returns on capital. And of course, I could mention other examples, but I just used this example to illustrate that almost every company can achieve high returns on capital in a single year, but only very few companies can sustain that high profitability. So that's why I think the main issue with the magic formula is that the magic formula screen only looks at a single year of ROIC. And for many magic formula stocks, the ROIC data for, used for the screen looks nothing like the historical ROIC of that company. It's often just an unusual spike, making the metric largely useless. While I was conducting some research for this video, I also came across the work of Tobias Carlyle. I think that's how you pronounce him. He's the author of the book The Acquirers Multiple and host of the podcast show with The Acquirers. Both are highly recommended, by the way. Anyways, I just wanted to point out that he showed that the magic, of magic formula outperformed because of the value component, because the value part alone did better than the magic formula. In his book, Quantitative Value, he showed that from 1964 to 2011, the S&P 500 returned 9.8%. And during the same period, Greenblatt's magic formula returned 12.8%. Certainly not bad. But the problem is that if you ignore the profitability measure of the magic formula and simply invested in value, you would have earned 14.5% over the very same period. So, is the magic formula broken or a bad screening tool? Quite frankly, I don't think so. I think it's a great tool and I also think it will work again in future periods. Generally, it's been a very tough period for value stocks ever since the 2008 crash and the following 10-year bull market. And Joel Greenblatt himself recently said in a podcast that if you had bought every company that lost money in 2019, that had a market cap of over $1 billion, I think it's 261 companies in total, you would be up 65% this year. But moreover, I think that intelligent investors should add some qualitative elements to the purely quantitative approach of the magic formula. So once you have the list of stocks provided by the magic formula screen, I think a follow-up examination is required. Has ROIC been consistently high for many years? What's the firm's position in the industry and how competitive, competitive is the industry in general? Does the company possess a durable mode that can sustain high ROIC numbers in the years ahead? And lastly, you might wonder if management's interests are aligned with shareholder interests. Also, I don't think that one should exclude profitability metrics. I think it depends on how you measure profitability. For instance, an alternative would be the so-called Buffett-Huckstrom screen. Uh, one of the components of this screen, I think it's 10 components in total. Well, one of the variables is a minimum yearly return on equity of 15% over the last three years. So this screen doesn't look at a single year, but a 
a longer period of time. And in my view, that's certainly a better way to measure profitability than just looking at a single year. So in conclusion, I think it should be obvious that no strategy should be bought into based on a backtest. A backtest is never a guarantee of future returns. Nonetheless, I believe that the magic formula is a powerful tool and I think it's also important to stress once again that the tool is for free. I agree that backtesting doesn't work as a standalone tool, but that doesn't mean it's not a helpful tool. Even if the results might not be as good as Greenblatt claims in his book. Overall, the magic formula screen is a great tool to generate stock ideas. I think you should only use the magic formula website to screen for ideas that then need some follow-up work to filter out companies that cannot sustain high ROIC. And in this context, I might also share the explanation the Twitter account that I cited at the beginning of the video provided for this phenomenon and the poor performance of the magic formula. The account Value Stock Geek posted the following. I think the ROIC hurts the magic formula more than value. When you're mechanically looking for high ROICs, you're finding a bunch of companies with targets on their back. The mode is critical when looking for ROIC. There isn't a mechanical way to find that. So would I recommend Greenblatt's book? Absolutely. I think it's a great place to get started. The principles taught in the book are timeless. And I think Greenblatt does a great job showing how insane Mr. Market is. And he also teaches some basics of valuation. I also think the book is a much easier read for beginners than, for instance, a book like Graham's Intelligent Investor. And with that being said, may your finances and investments prosper. Good luck.